so we're going to be looking at John chapter 4, verse 16. And so we know and rely on the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we have confidence on the day of judgment. Because in this world, we're like him. There's no fear in love. That's what we're going to focus on. There's no fear in love. Because fear has to do with punishment, and the one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Amen. So we started this book of 1 John. Are those things up? Keith, is that up? So we started this book of 1 John saying that the apostle John was picked up by Jesus and he was angry he had a bad temper, and by the end of his life, he becomes known as the apostle of love. What does that mean? It means that over the course of his life, he was transformed, transformed by Jesus. So here we are. John is looking at this issue of love in that fear, perfect love casts out all fear. So let's talk about this. There's no fear in love. So here's where we want to start. Let's read this together. Can everybody read this? Let's stand up and read this together. And so we know and we rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. Because in this world, we are like him. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. So we're going to talk about perfect love and perfect love driving out all fear. So um, that is, uh, anybody know who those guys are? Tom. Tom? That's Tom Simone, for those of you who don't know. And that, who's, who's the other person there? That is John Powell. Now, these guys are living in fear. <laughs> what are they afraid of? They're, they're afraid of running out of toilet paper. So we're going to talk about perfect love casting out all fear. But we don't want to be unreasonable, because running out of toilet paper is something to be afraid of. Yeah. <laughs> So anyway, I was afraid, so I hid myself. I was afraid, so I hid myself. This is where it comes back to fear. Where did fear, where did fear begin? In the garden. Fear begins in the beginning. Really, all you need is the book of Genesis. But if all you have is the book of Genesis, you'd be confused. You have to get to the end of the book. But once you get to the end of the book, you realize that the beginning of the book is all that you need. And you find this issue of fear happens when our great-great-grandparents are in the garden and they rebelled against God. And when they rebelled against God, something came into the creation, came into the human machine, fear, fear. What happened in the garden? God comes to them, and what does he say? You see, they had fellowship. They had unbroken fellowship. And what does he say to them? Where are you? Where are you? That's what my mother used to say to me. And my mother would say, where were you? And what would I say? Uh, nowhere. Nowhere. And she would say, who are you with? And I would say, nobody. nobody. And so when, when God came to them and said, where were you? Where were you? And who were you with? He said, I wasn't with anybody and I wasn't doing nothing. Is that true? No. Not at all. He was with somebody and he was doing something. And then he hid. Who was he hiding from? Because he covered himself up and he began to hide because he was fearful. And we do the same thing we've been hiding ever since. We hide behind makeup. We hide behind images of ourselves that we portray to others. We hide by hiding. Some of us just retreat. 
Some of us get away from people. Some of us remove ourselves. Who or what are we afraid of? It's the same old story. For thousands of years of human history, we've been afraid of God, we've been afraid of ourselves, and we've been afraid of others. And nothing has changed. Nothing has changed up to this weekend. We're afraid of God. We're afraid of people. We're afraid of ourselves. We're afraid of the circumstances around us. And so whatever we interpret as a threat ends up being a fear. So what are people afraid of? People are afraid of inflation. People are afraid of gas prices. People are afraid of terrorism. They're afraid of crime, violence, over sex saturated society, merit on faithfulness, economic instability. Anybody, anybody uh, got any 401ks or any stocks or any of that? Any, you know, it's a, it's a roller coaster this week. It is, it is up and down. It is all over the place. And so if you want to have, if, if you want some emotion, watch that that hour by hour and you'll get some emotion. Family, friends, coronavirus, all kinds of things to be afraid of. And, and in the Bible, there are words that are related to fear, including the words worry and anxiety. Those words are in the Bible, worry and anxiety. And what John says is perfect love casts out all fear. I love what this guy says, Norman Wright. He says anxiety is a feeling. Anybody ever have that feeling of anxiety? It's a feeling of dread, apprehension, or uneasiness. It produces a sense of approaching danger, but it doesn't necessarily come from a reasonable cause. Is that true, that sometimes the anxiety you have doesn't even come from a reasonable cause? <laughs> I have a friend, Brian is his name. He got married, and on his wedding night, he was gripped with fear <laughs> and anxiety. He said he was laying in the bed in this hotel room that they had rented, and he said there was clearly an evil presence in the room. He said, I was very, very aware of it. He said, I could feel it, and he said, I was getting afraid, and I didn't want to make my wife afraid, and he said, I could actually see it, that it was in the room. He said that in front of me, I could see it there looking at me. And he said, at one point, he said, I moved towards it, and it moved towards me. And he said, I'm freaking out, and I'm praying, and I'm thinking, oh, God, what do I do? And I, I don't want to flip my wife out. You know, what do I do? And he said, I moved to the side, and it moved sideways with me. And he said, I moved the other way, and it moved the other way with me. He said, I was freaking out. And he said, I didn't know what to do. He said, the only thing I knew what to do, he said, is I jumped out of bed, and I pointed at it. And I said, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. And his wife woke up flipped out, just like he didn't want to flip her out. She turned on the light, and he was looking in the mirror. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> the evil presence in the room is you. <laughs> it doesn't necessarily come from a reasonable cause. And for us, perfect love casts out all fear, and we have confidence in God. We've been talking about 1 John, God as our Father. And if we recognize God as our Father, we have someone that we can trust in. God, the perfect Father. And so there are those words in the, in the Scripture, worry and anxiety. They, they're found there. There are other words that we use. Nervousness. How are you feeling? Oh, I'm nervous. Worry, disquiet, misgiving, edginess, unnerved, unsettled, upset. Upset about what? Against others, maybe, maybe your own experiences. The word itself can mean to have a divided mind, to have a divided mind, this whole concept of, of worry, this whole concept of fear. Uh, Jesus had something to say about it. Jesus had a lot to say about it. He said, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear, now, you need to answer the question, because Jesus is asking the question, so I suppose we should answer it. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? What's the answer? Yes. yes. Is it yes or no? Yes. Is that a yes? <laughs> All right. Is not life more important than that? So Jesus is talking to them. When Jesus is talking to them, get this. It says that he went up onto the top of the mountain, 
His disciples followed him, and you know what he did? He sat down. That's what it says. He sat down. When Jesus was teaching this, he was sitting down. I love that Jesus was sitting down when he was teaching because what does, what does his posture tell you? He's relaxed. And how is he talking to the people? He, he's, 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 he's calm. He doesn't, he doesn't have one of these running around. <laughs> Not that there's anything necessarily wrong with that. Um, in fact, now that I have it, I might. But he's, he's sitting down and he's teaching. And, it, and as he's teaching, he's outside and you can see the grass and you can see the birds and you can see all of those things. And he uses them as illustrations. Um, he says, who of you, so which one in this room, which one to all of us that are, that are watching and listening, who by worrying can add a single hour to his life? Nobody. Nobody. And why do you worry about clothes? See the lilies of the field? Well, there must be lilies of the field out there when Jesus is sitting there up on top of that mountain. Those mountains there are hills. They call them mountains, but they're mostly hills. As he's sitting up there, you can probably see the lilies. They don't labor or spin, yet they're beautiful. Yet they're beautiful. Look what God has done for them. I love the ones that are coming up. We have ones coming up in our yard, those crocuses. I love to see those. I love to see those crocuses coming up. Those are like the most beautiful things on planet Earth. I don't know if I think they were as beautiful if it was in the middle of the summer compared to everything else. But when they come up, boy, they sure do look good. They don't labor or spin. And, they, and sometimes they don't stay up for very long. So if you miss them, you missed them. God has all of this beauty that we're just missing. On the bottoms of the oceans, we're just starting to discover stuff that it. it's fabulous, it's beautiful. The creation of God. And then he says, so don't worry. If that's the answer, then don't worry. In fact, we know that worrying doesn't add days to your life, that it can actually take away days from your life. That's what we know now. And so don't worry saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? <clears throat> or about the body. So categories, eat, drink, and wear the body therefore don't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow will worry about itself each day has enough trouble for its own see jesus is trying to teach us how to live so we're living in an interesting time we're living in an interesting week we're living in an interesting month we're living in an interesting season how should we live worry-free worry-free we don't have anything to worry about. You see, what it said in 1 John is we don't need to worry about judgment because Jesus has already paid the price for me. So the very worst that can happen to me is I can die. I don't want to be the bearer of bad news, but you're going to die. <coughs> All of us are going to die. The mortality rate in the United States is still 100%. Everybody that lives dies. But for those of us in Christ, we don't need to fear judgment when we see his face. Because we'll just be safe. So that's why the Apostle Paul said that to live is Christ. I get to live now in Christ. How should I live in Christ if I'm saved, if I belong to him, if I'm secure in him, if he's a good, good father, if he's God the father, God the perfect father, then I should be living really a worry-free life. I don't really have anything to worry about except with Tom and John, the toilet paper thing is a, is a serious crisis. <laughs> I don't have anything to really worry about. I'll be okay here and I'll be okay there. Well, the Apostle Paul had something to say about it too. The Apostle Paul said, don't be anxious about anything or be anxious for nothing is what some of the translations say. I like the one that says be anxious for nothing because you know what we're usually anxious about? Nothing. Nothing. Yeah. nothing. My, for, my poor friend Brian, huh? Rebuking himself in the mirror. <laughs> <laughs> You're the evil presence. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. We're going to do that in a minute. We're going to make our prayers and requests made known to God with thanksgiving. Because we don't want to just be asking, just whining, just begging. 
We want to do it with thanksgiving. We're thankful to be alive. Do you know that today has been declared a national day of prayer? That doesn't happen often. That doesn't happen often. And, and part of the reason for the prayer and the calling for it was so that we might persevere through this crisis. All right, that's a good one. Let's persevere through this crisis together. I love that together part. That's been, that's been my prayer, and that's been the burden of my heart. And that's what's bothered me for the longest time now is, is the non-togetherness. And so we're going to pray for that. We're going to pray for that. We're going to petition for that. We're going to open it up. We're going to sing a little bit, <clears throat> pray a little bit, National Day of Prayer. But don't be anxious about anything, nothing at all. But in everything, coronavirus, is that in everything? All right. Proverbs says this, that worry weighs a person down. I know this one, where it just pulls you down, pulls you all the way down. So what we want to look at is uh, uh, how love drives out fear, but there are positive aspects of fear. You might call them appropriate fears, but we have a little sign that it says, please do not feed the fears. <laughs> <laughs> because they will just get stronger and stronger. Because appropriate fears move you out of dangerous situations. When you see something that doesn't look right, when you feel something that doesn't look right, it moves you out of a dangerous situation. So God has put some kind of fear mechanism in us that's appropriate. So that you know it, it's too hot in here, or you know, something smells funny, or that's not right. And so because of that, God gives you these tools that cause us to be fearful of that situation. And it's appropriate to be fearful of that situation because it's a dangerous situation and you might want to pull somebody else out of that situation. So it moves us out of, out of dangerous situations. But it's a different kind of fear, but, but it motivates us to use caution. You slow down when you see something happening, maybe in the road in front of you. You slow down, you use caution. And then there's the fear of God, the fear of God, that I revere him, that I fear him. A lot of people say, well, that fear just means to kind of, you know, just you know, think of God as you know, just kind of more than you. Well, that Greek word is phobia, fear. God is God. God is God. And there is the appropriate fear of God, not the terror of God, but the fear of God. And so I know when I'm doing certain things, I should be fearful that he doesn't approve of that, doesn't approve of what I'm doing, the fear of God. But how does perfect love drive out all fear? A couple of ways. John has said in one of his earlier books, the Gospel of John, all that the Father gives to me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. We belong to him, and anyone who comes to him belongs to him. Perfect love drives out all fear. Some of us are not fear-free because we are on a path learning to understand God more fully as our Father. And as we understand him more fully, we are able to trust him more. As we're able to trust him more, fear starts to fall away. Because you've learned it, not only because you've learned it in his word, because this is what his word has said, but you are beginning to have experiential knowledge that tells you that he comes through every time. Because you've seen it happen in your life, and you've seen it happen in the people around you. You've seen that he is faithful. And then you start to read other stories and hear other things, and you find that he's always been faithful. Amen. John 14, he said, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another comforter to be with you forever. That word comforter, the Greek transliteration into English, would be paraclete. What does para mean? Come alongside. So if you're a paralegal, you come alongside the attorneys. If you're a paramedic, you come along the doctor. Uh, so paras coming alongside. And so the Holy Spirit is going to come, and the Holy Spirit is going to come alongside of us. When John writes this book, he starts it out. This, it's, not a, it's a book to us. It was a letter to them. And he said, we walked with him. We talked with him. 
We did the things he did. We went where he went. We were in proximity with Jesus. And of course, in the first century, if you knew that there were people who were in proximity of Jesus, you would think, well, maybe we're having an inferior experience because they were actually with Jesus, but we're with Jesus, but not like they were with Jesus because they were in his proximity. They could touch him. They could eat with him. Well, John said that he told us these things so that we might have fellowship with him, with them, that we could have the same fellowship that John and James and Peter and Andrew had with Jesus. They were in proximity with him, but we might be able to actually have more fellowship with him because when Jesus wasn't with them, then they weren't in proximity. But for us, the Holy Spirit has come and the Holy Spirit lives in us, and the Holy Spirit is with us all the time. We can have fellowship with God all the time, whether we are alone, whether we are in a group, whether we're in a crisis, whether we're in a good time, whether we're in a victory, whether our team is doing good or whether our team is doing bad. He is with us all the time, the Holy Spirit who dwells in us, and we are fellowshipping with God, fellowshipping with God. And so if we're fellowshipping with God, what is there to be afraid of? What is there to be afraid of? We're going to read this um, <clears throat> verse together. It's in a different translation, Romans. But let's read it. For I am convinced that nothing ever separates us from his love. Death can't and life can't. The angels won't and all the powers of hell itself cannot keep God's love away. Our fears for today, our worries about tomorrow, or where we are, high above the sky, or in the deepest ocean, nothing will ever be able to separate us from the love of God demonstrated by our Lord Jesus when he died for us. So what can separate us from the love of God? Just ourselves, really. We're our, we're our biggest enemies. We're, we're the ones who sort of create separation and allow anxiety to come in. Here's the ultimate... Um, the ultimate fear, Hebrews addresses this. The ultimate fear is the fear of death, being afraid to die. Hebrews says this, since the children, us, have flesh and blood, he too, Jesus, shared our humanity so that by his death, he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all of their lives were held in slavery to the fear of death, afraid to die. So why, why are we afraid to die? There's a lot of reasons that we're afraid to die. One of them is that we fear pain and the suffering that precedes death. That's why I want to preach the gospel to every creature on earth because I want to move the clock forward so that we all can go in the rapture. I don't want to die. I want to meet them in the sky. And we need to get going because we're running out of time for that to happen. <laughs> a lot of us are going to die in pain. And we're afraid of that. We don't want that. A lot of people, of course, they don't want to die because of the fear of the unknown. Particularly if you have no confidence in God as Father. What's going to happen? What's on the other side? What is that? People still, the polls show over and over again when they poll people that it's always somewhere between 87 and 91 percent of people believe in life after death, even if they have no answer for what happens life after death. So what happens? What's there? What happens to me? There are other fears, fears of leaving friends and family, particularly leaving things undone leaving things that haven't been tied up, hopes that maybe you had for your family, maybe hopes that you had for your children, things that you wanted to happen, and you don't want to leave that behind. You're like, I can't leave now. I can't die now. I have things that I need to do. I have people that I need to take care of. And even if you have great confidence in God, who's going to raise you from the dead, many times we're like, no, I need to, I need to finish this stuff. Well, the point there is, well, let's get at it then. If it needs to be finished, let's be working on it now. 
we're going to make the point in just a minute here that what we need to be doing is just the ordinary things. The ordinary things. The important things. What are the really important things? We fear maybe we haven't finished our task. Today, 80% of people are dying away from home. And an awful lot of people have a fear of dying alone. They don't want to die and die alone. And, and we fear death because we don't understand it. It's, it's hard to imagine death as a loving friend. How do you see that as a friend? How do you see death as a loving friend? But God can prepare us for it. And, and we, fear the, we fear the unknown with no prospect of a return ticket. Here's a hint for you. You can get round trip tickets all over the USA right now <laughs> for like $40, $50 round trip. But here's the deal. Then this is really the deal is that if you fly round trip, you might not be able to fly back. <laughs> and so that's the fear that there's no ticket back. But the truth is we're all terminal. We're all terminal. So before we pray and do some other stuff and find out what we're supposed to be doing right now, that's an image of C.S. Lewis who 75 years ago, he was living in the time of World War II in London. And so he was very moved by the things that were happening there in London and happening in the war. And he lived in the time where they saw the atomic bomb go off. Could you imagine living in that day, being a, an adult, a young adult, an adolescent, when that thing went off? Just the power of it and the horror of that. Who else has one? And what's going to happen with that? And the atomic age brought on a whole new fear for us. There's a magazine, a bulletin, the Bulletin of, of, of Atomic Scientists, that every year in December, they have the atomic doomsday clock. And it's always sitting somewhere just a little bit before 12. And so it started with this whole atomic age. And this is what C.S. Lewis says about his time. He said, how are we to live in the atomic age? I'm tempted to reply, why? Just as you would have lived in the 16th century when the plague visited London almost every year. Or as you would have lived in a Viking age when the raiders from Scandinavia might land and cut your throat any night. Or indeed, as you're already living in the age of cancer, age of syphilis, age of paralysis, age of air raids, age of railway accidents, and age of motor accidents. In other words, this is the phrase. Do not let us begin exaggerating the novelty of our situation. Do not let us begin exaggerating the novelty of our situation. Believe me, you and all whom you love were already sentenced to death before the atomic bomb was invented. Believe me, you were all sentenced to death before coronavirus was even named. And quite a high percentage of us are going to die in unpleasant ways. We had indeed one great advantage over our ancestors, anesthetics. You can go out without knowing it. But one very great advantage over our ancestors, but we, but we still have. It's perfectly ridiculous to go about whimpering and drawing long faces because scientists have added one more chance of painful and premature death to the world, which has already bristled with such chances in which death itself was not a chance at all, but a certainty. So let's not begin by exaggerating the novelty of our situation. <clears throat> this is the first point to be made. And the first action is to pull ourselves together. If we're all going to be destroyed by an atomic bomb, coronavirus, whatever, let that bomb come when it finds us doing sensible and human things. Praying, working, teaching, reading, listening to music, bathing the children, 
playing tennis, chatting with our friends, a game of darts, not huddled together like frightened sheep thinking about bombs. They may break our bodies, a microbe could do that, but they do not need to dominate our minds. So what are we gonna do? What are we going to do and who are we going to be? People who perfect fear is driving out all, perfect love is driving out all fear. What are we going to be like? Who are we going to be? These things are not new, I love what he says. I wish I would have memorized it. Do not let us begin by exaggerating the novelty of our situation. In the 1400s, there was the Black Plague that just almost wiped out Europe. Anybody remember that? <laughs> Anybody feel like you could have remembered that? And you're, you're that old? Interesting thing happened with the Black pl Plague. <clears throat> it was happening in the cities, and although they, don't have the, they didn't have the technology or the science to really understand what was going on, they understood some things because you can see things and make some conclusions from what you see. And the plague was wiping out cities. So you knew if you were in the city that it was worse in the city than it was in the countryside. Now, you might not know why, but you start to come to some conclusions. You know, maybe there's things being passed around or whatever. And so many people from the cities were running into the countryside. And if you had an uncle or an aunt or an old lost friend in the countryside, you were good to go because you could just move out of the city and maybe sit this thing out. And so while a lot of people were fleeing out of fear, out of a legitimate fear for their lives, there were people that were coming into the city. Cities. And the people that were coming into the cities were the Benedictine monks. And they decided that rather than flee and save their life, they were going into the city to do what? To serve the dying, to serve the hopeless, to, to bring hope to the hopeless, to minister to people with their spiritual needs, their physical needs, to minister to them. By the time the plague was over, the Benedictine monks had been reduced by 90%. They lost their lives serving. What's so bad about that? What's so bad about losing your life serving? What, what else are our lives for? What are we going to do? Who are we going to be? I love what C.S. Lewis is saying. Let's just stay calm and do what it is that we're supposed to be doing. What is it that you're supposed to be doing? Elizabeth Elliot. <laughs> I don't know if you know who Elizabeth Elliot is. If you can find anything by Elizabeth Elliot, read it, listen to it. Her husband and her and some others went to try to win cannibals to Christ. And those guys killed him. They didn't kill Elizabeth Elliot, but they killed her husband. She went back to that tribe, won that tribe to Jesus. Isn't that amazing? Won them to Jesus. And I had the privilege of ministering with her one time. And what a lady she was. My word. When Elizabeth Elliot spoke, you just straightened right up. You just, she was, she was no nonsense at all. Elizabeth Elliot has a very well-known teaching. See if you can find it on the internet somewhere. Download it. It's called Do the Next Thing. And she says, you need to just live a steady life. And you just need to do the next thing. You need to put one foot in front of the other foot. She said, if there's a death in the family, what do you do? She said, it's simple. She said, you feed the kids oatmeal. You don't feed them that stupid stuff in the aisles at the grocery store. You feed them oatmeal, and you feed them on time. And then when it's ready to do the next meal, you feed them the next meal. She said, you, sit, you put one foot in front of the other, and you do what it is that you're supposed to be doing. You do the thing that you're always supposed to be doing. Just stay steady. Just stay steady. And not only stay steady, you have something to contribute because you're the one that can go and get the oatmeal. We can go into the cities. Why not? Why not us? There's a story told of D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody was a famous evangelist in the 1800s. He was a household name. Everybody knew his name. Uh, 
People know the name of Billy Graham, his son Franklin Graham. They know, they know the names of those guys, their household names, and whatever you think of them, you still know their names. And so in the day, he was making a journey across the Atlantic in a freighter. And a terrible storm came up. Horrible, horrible storm. So much so that the people in the freighter thought that they were dead. They thought they were done. And so people, many non-praying people, went down into the main room and they were praying together. Everybody was praying together. And somebody said, Moody's on the ship. He's not here. Somebody go get him to pray. And they went looking for him. And they found him. He had his arms over the rail and he was watching the storm watching the storm. And they said, Mr. Moody, we're having a prayer meeting downstairs. Do you want to come with us and pray? And he said, I'm all prayed up. I'm all prayed up. I'm ready. I'm ready to do whatever it is. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to die. I'm all prayed up. I'm ready. So what are we going to do with our lives in this time, in these days? Will we be able to meet here next week? We were on a call. We had an elders meeting yesterday, and we were on a call. We had Anthony Chapman on with us. We were on for two hours. Anthony was calling us from, he was calling in from Israel. His face was real big on the screen. He was dominating us. <laughs> and uh, his phone binged. Bing! And he said, whoa! He said, I just got a note here that Benjamin Netanyahu in one hour is, shoot, is shutting the entire nation of Israel down, that every business is closing. And I thought, how can you close down every business? How can you do that? You can just close down every business? He said, oh, he said, it looks like they're going to let us get groceries somehow. Shut down all travel, shut down all business. We're going to be here next week? I don't know. I don't know. Um, I know he'll, he'll be here, and he'll be with us, right? So we're living in a very interesting, very interesting time, very, very interesting juncture, very interesting, very interesting day. Um, let's see, I, I hope these videos work. So here's some of the guys that were with us yesterday, our Calvary Chapel pastors. Uh, when we were talking about this passage yesterday, 1 John, and we talked about the corona crisis. So they're not all present, but let's see. I hope these videos work, because the last one didn't. So there's Mr. Newer. <laughs> so... I think of uh, some, some Bible stories of uh, the disciples freaking out on the boat, you know, in the, in the storm, and they went and they got Jesus, and he was sleeping, you know. And then I think about um, Elisha sleeping when the, the army was outside, and the servant came and wake him up, freaking out, you know. And he's like, just don't even worry about it, you know. These guys were experiencing really fearful situations, and they were taking naps. So I think we should all go get some sleep. But <laughs> seriously though, I think that's the, the mindset we should have of just resting in God's perfect love, knowing that he's got this fearful times, but you know, all these Bible stories, David facing Goliath, Daniel the lion's den, it didn't stop them from uh, doing what God wanted them to do. So God's going to do what we all have to fear, and uh, God's got this. He took Elizabeth Elliot and turned her up a notch. Let's take a nap. <laughs> That's Steve. Steve's the campus pastor up at, up at Goshen Hill. They're watching us right now. Say hello to them. Because here's what we're going to do. We're going to take this little teaching and these voices together, and we're going to send them to our friends. Hey, do this. So we'll, we'll send this out. And your friends are watching right now because somebody, somebody loves you. Here's what we're saying about the coronavirus. Because perfect love casts, casts out all fear, you know, Peter tells us to cast all, our, all of our anxieties upon God because he cares for us. To be sober-minded, to be watchful because our adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. To devour. So let's be sober-minded. Let's keep our faith rooted in God and the truth of his word and not run around like crazy because all of society is running around like crazy. But let's really return to our roots and our faith in the Lord Jesus. 
that keeps us strong, that keeps us standing upright when the storms rage, and cast our anxieties upon him because, you know, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. God bless you. Took me 25 minutes to say what he said in 45 seconds. It's Brother Powell, I hope he found his toilet paper. When we were in Walmart, I bumped into a couple of guys I knew. Their wives had sent them out for toilet paper. So, uh. Thinking about how to get through this whole situation with this coronavirus, I'm reminded of a uh, scripture in 2 Timothy 1.7. For the spirit that God gives us is not fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. And it causes me to be mathematical. Am I going to walk in the one which is fear and freak out and go buy everything on the store shelves, or am I gonna trust God and walk in his power, his love, and with it, it'll give me a sound mind. We should vote. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Rick. A crisis like this could be exactly what God uses to bring families together, considering the hustle and bustle and the way that life moves so fast nowadays, and it seems that families has, have less and less time to spend together. And something like this could bring us together in such a way where that lacking intimacy could be there, could be redeveloped. People, fam Sorry, Rick, I cut Rick off because I told everybody they had 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I should have let you go. <laughs> but that, but oh, Rick, Rick, somebody, somebody here in the congregation said, but that was enough. So uh, that was enough. That was a good word. Uh, Aaron, Aaron videoed in. He wasn't, he wasn't feeling well. Uh, tell me if you can tell. Yeah. Hey, Church Aaron here. I just want to talk about the importance of faith, hope, and love and how important is it for a healthy church and a believer. See, faith is strong belief in something. You know, faith takes care of the past. We have a strong belief in Jesus. We have faith in what Jesus has done for us on the cross. Hope it looks to the future. It's the expectation of coming good. We know Jesus is going to return, so there's no need to worry about what lies ahead. You know, if we do this, it frees us to love. And as we're going to learn this week, perfect love casts out all fear. Peace. Good stuff. He's sitting in the room right now. So this week I was thinking about what people were saying on CNN and Fox and taking it seriously. And you should take it seriously. But I don't think we should ever take it more seriously than what God says. And what it says in Philippians is don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And things like this. People don't understand things and they take precautions, but God has it figured out. He's working right now. He's working in our families. He's putting us together for a reason. So let's get together. Let's, let's huddle together. Let's share our faith with one another and use this as an opportunity to, uh, to get to know each other better. But more importantly, get to know God better. God bless you guys. Hi, it's Glenn McKenzie coming to you from my shop. This day and age with the uh, coronavirus going around and schools closing, and businesses shutting, I keep holding on to one of my favorite passages of scripture in Hebrews 6 that talks about the anchor of hope for our souls. Our souls, our mind, our will, and our emotion. We have an anchor of hope and this anchor holds strong. I love the passage that keeps going. It talks of Jesus being our forerunner, going before us in any situation that we face. We follow Jesus. He's already gone before us. We just follow him, and he promises that our anchor will hold, and it's an anchor of hope in the very holies of holies. I just want to encourage everyone, including myself, that we have hope in Jesus. Good, so uh, <clears throat> here's the hope that we have to share. There's a holy God, sinful people are trying to reach God, always falling short with, with whatever the good life. 
benevolence, <coughs> service, doing things, being good, stopping at stop signs. Stopping at the yellow instead of trying to make it through. <laughs> trying to get to God. But uh, Christianity is different. It's God coming to people. It's God coming to people. And the, the cross bridges the gap. Makes it possible for us to, to know God and to come to God. So this is our message. It's the message that we have for the world. For those without hope. For those without hope. Here's the way it's described in this little booklet. There's the self-directed life, where there it has self on the throne, and all of your in interests are directed by self, resulting in discord and frustration. And Christ is outside of the life. It's outside of the life. But the Christ-centered life is Christ is on the throne. Self is yielded to Christ. And all of our interests are directed by him, resulting in harmony with God's plan. Some of my missionary heroes are people known as the Moravians. Anybody ever hear of the Moravians? Probably not too many people. Ever hear of the Moravian missionaries? Yeah, a few. You don't hear of the Moravians because the Moravians died off. And the reason that the Moravians died off, they had a 100-year prayer meeting, and they used to tithe their congregation. They used to take a tenth of their congregation and tithe it to missions. So if you were part of their group, their Bible study, their worship services, there was the expectation that one out of ten is going to leave here and go somewhere. And they had a particular burden for the Mosquito Coast. You know where that is in Central America? There's that curve there. And that whole coast, they had a burden for, for all of that, including the Caribbean. Now, this was several hundred years ago in the 1700s, 1800s. They had a burden for the Caribbean. They had a burden for the Mosquito Coast. They would tithe their people. They would fund them, send them and fund them, and pray for them as they went to reach people in that unreached area, particularly the Caribbean. And in the Caribbean in the 1700s, the Caribbean was the center of slave trade. It was where slaves were wholesaled out. They would bring them into the Caribbean and then wholesale them to the other places where they would be sold. And the Moravians, in order to reach those communities, you know what some Moravian missionaries did? They sold themselves as slaves. Free people sold themselves as slaves to do what? To reach the people that they would be traveling with, to reach the people that they would be living with, and to reach the people in the Caribbean and along the Mosquito Coast and other places. Soon one life will be but past, and only what's done for Christ will last. We all have an incredible opportunity before us. So we're going to um, spend a few minutes in prayer.